Yo guys, welcome to the Zelda Fiction. Today we are gonna see, what if Naruto was the Grand Emperor in Bleach. Part 1. Huge shout out to Darth Malleus for this story. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Who am I? Where do I come from? What am I? Where do I belong? These are questions which I asked myself at first, when I awoke in this accursed land. I don't know who I am, or where I originally come from. I don't know what I am, and as far as I know I belong nowhere. I have no name, none that I remember. As to how old I am, well, when the years turn to decades, centuries, even millennia one eventually stops counting. All I know is at first I had the visage of an animal, a long sinewy creature with skin of hardened white carapace, and nine flowing tails followed me wherever I went like a shroud. I was smaller than most creatures, and at first I thought of it as a weakness. It was not until I made my first kill that I realized that size mattered very little in this world, and I have killed many more since then. Over time my body began to change, and over a course of hundreds of years, I slowly changed from a four-legged creature to a two-legged, bipedal form. By my 1500th year I had become what my subconscious saw me as, what I most likely looked like when I was human. Over these long years I slowly realized that not only was my body evolving, but my intelligence as well, I began to remember things and commit them to memory. I quickly realized that I was not like the others around me, for one I didn't seem to follow their evolutionary cycle. I didn't need to merge with hundreds of hollows to become what was known as a Jillian. Even the higher levels didn't look anything like me, for although they took on more human appearances, it couldn't hold a candle to me. It was not until many years later that I realized that I had become the first true Vasto Lord level Minos Grand. Over time I found others just like me, stronger than the rest who had gained almost completely human visages. We traveled together for a time before separating, carving out nine vast territories in this world to call our own. We would go down in legend and lore as the nine lords of Waco Mundo. The first nine hollow to be truly called Vasto Lord. There had been none before and none nearly as powerful since. We were the mothers and fathers of the final evolutionary hurdle, brothers and sisters who transcended life and death. We became monsters with a conscience, monsters that reclaimed their souls as well as our bodies and intelligence. I even remembered my own name. It was Naruto, Naruto Uzumaki. I was the first to remember my name, but I would not be the last. The others slowly began to remember their identities, and over time we became something more than those around us. We became Vasto Lord. We became the Nine Lords of Waco Mundo. Ara the Ichibi no Shukaku. Ujido, the Nibi no Nekamata. Igura, the Sambi no Kaidagam. Yashi, the Yambi no Seru. Rin, the Gobi no Akami. Udicate, the Rakubi no Namakuji. Fu, the Nanabi no Kabachimashi. Garabi, the Hachibi no Kaiajo. And me, Naruto, the Kayubi no Yoko. Our reign lasted for millennia, and then something happened. It began as a rumor that one of our siblings, the fifth lord, Rin, had vanished from her territory. Then news slowly reached my wizened ears that the others had suffered a similar fate, one by one I lost contact with my siblings, until I knew I was all that remained, and that I was next. I still remember that day. The day I met the ones who had driven a wedge into our combined domains. He called himself the King of the Soul Society, Spirit King, and his thirteen warriors, the first captains of the Shinigami Court. They introduced themselves as such. I had heard of the term Shinigami before, but I had never met ones of such raw spiritual pressure. I learned that they were the ones who hunted down my comrades to eliminate us as a threat to both them and the worlds they watched over. With that they struck, but I was not defenseless. The battle lasted for days, destroyed my fortress and massacred the majority of my subordinates. In return I had personally killed six of his captains and engaged him. Our battle had been a battle of gods, one that scarred the very earth and turned the surrounding landscape into wastelands. The eternal desert of Waco Mundo came into existence through this conflict. He won by doing what he had done to my comrades, by whittling down my strength and sealing me away, under the ruins of my fortress for all eternity. Centuries passed, and while my body had been sealed my soul was still able to see the goings-on of Waco Mundo. The Nine Lords became stories of legend, then myth, and it was many centuries before something interesting happened again. Shinigami had entered my fortress, now a ruin, and defeated the one who had called it home, some young pup named Baragon, supposed god king of Waco Mundo. God of Hollows preserve me. How far our race has fallen if that skeletal fool is one of the strongest. The Shinigami returned my fortress to its former glory and gathered an army with his goal being all out war with the Soul Society and to take the Spirit King's place. If only he knew I was down here I might have helped him, but he seemed a little off for my tastes. He gathered ten of the strongest Minos he could find and through some unnatural alchemy turned them into something not hollow nor Shinigami, a rancor, yes that was what he called them. A rancor. A spada. 
I didn't know how it happened, maybe it was just the age of time whittling away the effectiveness of the seal I was trapped in, or perhaps it was the presences of so many powerful beings that weakened my prison. All I know is that over time I felt my coffin getting weaker and weaker, until it was weak enough for me to tweak it, push the barrier back and forth, until hairline cracks began to form. It would only take a single burst of my spiritual pressure to blow the top off, and I would be free. I waited until I felt the presences above me begin to disappear. I may have been considered the more powerful of the first Basto Lord, but so many years of captivity had weakened me to the point where I would not have been able to defeat everyone skulking about my fortress. So I slept. I had waited for a couple of a thousand years, what was another hundred. I wasn't sure how long I slept for, maybe a few hours or a few years. I didn't really keep count. But I was jarred awake by a great explosion of spiritual pressure, then another and another. It must have been impressive if it awoke someone like me. There was a battle taking place above, and it looked like it was winding down. I reached out with a withered hand, pressing it against the cool surface of my coffin. The seal had corroded to the point where the slightest blast of energy would have shattered it. I spoke, voice croaking and raspy after so many years of disuse. Well, might as well say hi. I released a small amount of several thousand years of pent-up spiritual pressure. Maybe a little too much. But it did the trick. Ayakuya Kachiki had felt many powerful spiritual pressures in his lifetime, as a captain of the Gatija Santai he had been called upon to deal with many a powerful hollow, and just recently he had been selected as part of an infiltration group to find and aid the substitute Shinigami and his allies when they haphazardly entered Hueko Mundo against their advice. He was the head of the prestigious Kachiki family, captain of the 6th Shinigami Court Guard Division, and considered one of the strongest and most experienced captains of the next generation, yet in all of his years as a Shinigami captain, he had never felt a spiritual pressure this huge, not even the Zero Espada who stood before him in his released form. Not the battle-loving captain of the 11th Division nor the clearly mad scientist captain of the 12th were nearly as powerful. The ground several dozen meters behind them bulged and exploded, throwing sand and rock high into the air, allowing a powerful blade of crimson spiritual pressure to break through and pierce the air with an almost suffocating aura. It reached so high that it pierced through the ceiling of the fortress of Las Notches, an impressive feat considering the incredible size of this place and the height of its roof. The battle between Shinigami and Aranker came to a sudden halt as the three combatants turned to watch the spectacle in both wonder and terror. Bayakuya Kachiki wasn't familiar with this powerful Ritsu, but knew at an almost instinctive level that it spelt more bad news for the infiltration team of Shinigami captains. The figure stepped through the crimson energy as simply as a man would step through Mr. Fog, hand making a simple horizontal cutting gesture that dispelled the spiritual pressure surrounding him. He was clothed in rags which might have once been considered clothing, but he could not discern their original color as they were covered in dirt and filth. He took the guise of an old man, face wrinkled and tanned from extreme age hair, turned white from age, stringy and unkempt as it fell all the way down to the small of his back. Exposed skin marred with liver spots and form as thin as a rake, ribs pulling his skin taut and wiry arms and legs. He was literally nothing more than skin and bones. The eyes were the only thing that did not look decrepit, a brilliant blue which showed an abundance of life and intelligence behind them. He looked around and took a deep breath before breaking into a mass of sputtering, hacking and coughing. He spoke after he regained control, voice raspy and croaking from what seemed like lack of use. Um, I suppose I have to fix this shouldn't I? He didn't wait for anyone to answer as a dense spiritual pressure surrounded him, crimson and bubbling, so strong that anyone not captain level on the rector scale would have fallen to their knees or collapsed into unconsciousness, even death. Bayakui looked on with a wide-eyed fascination as this being transformed before them. His wrinkled and liver-spotted skin became smoother and took on a more healthy tan. As he de-aged right in front of them, Bayakuya noticed whisker marks on the man's face, three on each cheek. He watched as muscles started to bulge across his body before it was overtaken by cloth, as the rags seemed to recover into actual clothing. The white shirt and pants, black knee-high boots and a white overcoat lined with black. His white hair bleached from white to a vibrant gold, before being cut from the flick of his right wrist. A mass of blonde locks fell to the desert sands, as that which remained seemed to spike naturally. What stood before them as the spiritual pressure receded was not an old man of skin and bones, but a young man in his early to mid-twenties, handsome and powerful with a broad grin of white teeth. When he spoke his voice was not croaking and raspy, but gravelly and cheerful. Ah, that's better. The three Shinigami captains and one Espada blinked as they looked at this creature as he himself began to look around, a look of awe on his features, as he checked out the huge fissure running along the ceiling of the Grand Fortress. A reminder of the colossal battle which took place between Ichigo Kurosaki and the fourth Espada, and then he looked around at the ruins of the once Grand Las Notches. Wow, someone's really been redecorating this place. 
Must have gone insane from all these neutral colors, I mean really, white, did the decorator have an off day or something? He looked down at his clothes before making a distasteful face. Where is the life in these things? Where is the color and vibrancy? Ayakuya blinked at the new arrival's rant before looking at the expressions of his fellow captains. It was what he had expected. The captain of the 12th division looked at this man with a mixture of awe and clinical fascination, not surprising considering Mayuri Kuritsuchi was a scientist right down to his rotten core. The captain of the 11th division looked at the new arrival with a manic grin. Obviously Zaraki Kanpachi wished more than anything else to fight this mysterious newcomer. Surprisingly it wasn't him who spoke first. It was the Zero Espada, Yami Largo. The giant monstrosity roared angrily at this fourth opponent, making the blonde turn around and look at the Aranker with narrowed eyes, almost giving the impression his eyes were slanted. He didn't look very intimidated, Kichiki realized, more like questioning. Who the hell do you think you are? The giant roared as he neared closer to the blonde stranger, three original opponents forgotten. Waltzing in here like you own the place. You must have a death wish. Who the hell do I think I am? The newcomer asked with a broad grin, even as the most powerful of the Espada reared back his huge fist for a blow, which would have probably leveled an entire building, or a block of buildings. Why I'm Naruto Uzumaki, and I waltzed in here like I owned the place because. The fist came down with a thunderous crash, throwing up tons of sand and debris, as it made contact with its target. It took some time for the dust to finally settle, but when it did the blonde stood, unmoving and unhurt, hand raised in a palm, which seemed to stop the multiple times larger fist of the released Espada, like it was child's play. Because, he continued, smile still in place, but without even a trace of mirth. I waltzed into this place because I own this place. He vanished in a blur of motion, completely disappearing from Bayakuya's senses. Then he reappeared right in front of the Zero Espada, hand reached out as if to flick the story tall giant's forehead which he did, sending Yami skidding back by several dozen meters before falling on his spiked back, flattening the remains of what must have once been a cylindrical pylon. The blonde landed in a crouch, azure eyes glaring at the fallen giant with an intensity Bayakuya could feel from his place, then they settled on him and he froze, feeling a mass of killing intent which would have killed most humans. Now then, not to sound cliche but. He stood, spread his hands and looked to the broken roof of Waco Mindo. After 3000 years I live again. Mayuri Kuritsuchi, Captain of the 12th Division. Inpachi Zaraki, Captain of 11th Division. Ayakuya Kachiki, Captain of 6th Division. All three men were some of the most powerful Shinigami the Gatija Santai had seen in several generations. Captain Kuritsuchi was one of the most intelligent Shinigami to hold the position, barring his predecessor and creator of the infamous Shinigami Research and Development Institute, Kisu Kurahara. Denpachi Zaraki was one of the deadliest Shinigami the Soul Society had ever seen, killing his predecessor, even without achieving Shikai or Bankai. He wasn't even able to speak with his Zanpakuto, and yet he was one of the most feared men in history. Ayakuya Kachiki was one of the finest swordsmen to come from the Four Noble Houses, who were already well known for their capacity to produce excellent Shinigami, handed down the position of captain when his grandfather, Ginrei Kachiki, knew he was ready and retired. All three men were some of best and most deadly of their generation. They had seen much in their century as captains of the 13 Shinigami Court Guard Divisions and were not easily intimidated or surprised. But it appeared these last few years had been nothing but one surprise after another. First a human who gained Shinigami powers was able to not only break into the Soul Society but defeat Captain Class Shinigami and rescue his target. Then Sasuke Zen, a respected fellow captain of the Shinigami Court Guard, not only betrayed the Shinigami but fell in league with their deadliest foes, the Hollows, to gain his objectives. He took two other captains with him when he defected, which was another surprise. Now these three captains had just gained their fourth great surprise. A single man appeared before them and not only stood up to the most powerful of Azen's creations, but sent him flying with a simple poke of his finger. They didn't recognize either him or his spiritual pressure, but it was powerful, terrifyingly powerful. Now the three captains simply looked on with a mixture of bafflement and fascination, as this strange man hopped up and down, rolling his shoulders and cranking his neck almost as if he was exercising before a major workout. His expressive azure eyes were glinting with anticipation, and the toothy grin he wore didn't waver as the zero espada groggily rose, shaking his head as blood trickled down his face. Another surprise, that poke had enough power behind it to puncture the hiero, the armored skin of a released rancor, and a spada at that. Hey, buddy boy. Yami froze and glanced back to see the blonde-haired stranger sitting idly on his shoulder. His head quickly looked back and forth from the place where his opponent once stood to the place where he now sat. The image standing on the sands just seemed to dissolve into the very air. He moved so fast that he left an afterimage behind. What were you looking at? 
Only the Septima Espada, Zamaria Rowe, was able to move at such advanced speeds. Yami turned to glare at the idle blonde, but instead blinked when he saw the man pointing at his nose, that same toothy grin still in place. Bang. A zero exploded from his fingertip, a simple ball of crimson energy which exploded into a concentrated beam of deadly spiritual pressure. The blast slammed into the zero spot's nose, and a snap of crushed bone and cartilage echoed through the broken fortress. Yami roared in anguish before falling back to the desert sands, blood splattering from his recently broken nose. The blonde form dissolved into the air as the zero espada hit the ground with such force that a small-scale earthquake shook the fortress, loose Ekaseki rock fell away from half-demolished structures. There was almost a full minute of silence before those assembled knew that the espada wasn't going to be getting back up anytime soon. The captains were immediately on alert, searching the dunes for any sign of the newest warrior. They found him standing a scant few meters behind them, bound theatrically, head downturned and blonde bangs covering his upper face. That grin was still in place, but with what was witnessed it had a more vicious aura about it. Who are you? Kachiki asked, outwardly unimpressed by the display, even as his hand slowly strayed for the unsheathed hilt of his anpakuto. It doesn't matter. The blonde straightened, looking at each man in turn before a smirk crossed his whiskered features. You three can just think of me as the talking heir. The talking heir? Kenpachi scoffed at the notion, pointing his ragged sword at the newcomer. What kind of name is that? If you're the talking heir then do us all a favor, stop talking. Who's scary, the blonde's voice was full of sarcasm before gaining a trace of anger. It seems that not much has changed after 3000 years. You Shinigami have always had no manners, even with the first generation it was always the superior attitude and BP cannot be beaten belief that really pissed me off. He began slowly walking towards them, hands in his pant pockets and posture giving off an air of non-interest, but with every step he took the air got thicker and thicker. His eyes were like twin dead pits of blue as he calmly watched them, and once he was within ten paces he spoke, voice commanding. What are you doing in my domain? The spiritual pressure was so dense it was almost palpable, yet the captain simply looked on, finally one of them replied. It was Kuritsuchi, hopping down from his perch. What do you mean your domain? The blonde grinned, but it was maniacal and full of malice. Exactly what I meant, all that you see here is mine. From the eternal desert to the underground forests to the fortress itself is my domain, my territory. This is a sanctuary for the lost, Shinigami have no authority and no right to be here. Pinpachi snarled, who the hell are you? They're obviously not one of Aizen's little pets, Mayuri added, completely ignoring the 11th Division captain's murderous glare. The blonde grinned as he brought up his right hand, thumb pointing at his face. Who am I? Let me tell you a story. Three thousand years ago the first generation of Shinigami captains came to this land. They pillaged, destroyed and purified, but of the numerous thousands of lost souls, there were nine who had the power to match them, and best them, the nine lords of Waco Mundo. The Shinigami knew that if these nine vast lord gathered then they had no chance of victory, so they picked them off one by one, unable to kill us, but seal us. Bayuri scoffed, catching his fellow captain's attention. Are you having a laugh? The Nine Lords are a myth, a bedtime story parents tell annoying brats to make them eat their food and go to bed. Nine Lords, don't make me laugh boy. Boy. The blonde looked up at Mayuri, and the density of the spiritual pressure became visible as a mass of bubbling crimson. You have the audacity to call me a boy. Do not test me you young pup. I and my siblings had achieved the ultimate evolution before your great-grandfather was a twinkle in your great-great-grandmother's eye. Ayakuya felt a chill run down his spine at the words. He had also heard of the story of the Nine Hollow Lords, according to legend they were the mothers and fathers of Mino's Grand, the first to reach such heights of power and savagery. Mayuri looked like he was about to gag, drawing his form back as if he had tasted something foul. I and my siblings. Unable to kill us but seal us. Are you saying, Bayakuya began, noticing that the 12th Division Captain began to take in shaky breaths. That you are one of the Nine Lords of Waco Mundo. The man grinned at him, a toothy, predatory grin. So there is a brain amongst you three. Which one are you? Bayakuya asked, hand now on his Zanpakuto. You cannot be the second, fifth or seventh lord. They were all female hollows if I remember the tale. Ah yes, Naruto spun around, hands outstretched, wicked grin still in place. Yujito chan whose beauty was only matched by the sharpness of her claws, Rin-chan, how gorgeous she was when she howled at the moon. She was always at her best on those full moon nights. Fu-chan, whose voice was as haunting as it was stunning. Ujido the Crimson Claw, Rin of the Bloody Moon and Fu of the Ruby Wings, Mayuri muttered, only to hear a smash of laughter from the supposed Lord. I can see the Soul Society has vilified even those three maidens. I suppose victory really is written by the victors, eh? He stopped spinning and bowed majestically. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, and I am the Ninth Lord. Their expressions were hilarious. 
Bayakuya's eyes widened until they were the size of saucers, Mayuri was completely silent, though he looked like he had swallowed something sour. The most interesting was from Kenpachi, who didn't seem worried in the slightest, if anything he looked disappointed. Oh, I suppose that means you're the weakest huh? A smile spread across the bound blonde's face as he raised his head and straightened his posture. You obviously don't know our story do you? Let me educate you, son. It's not the number one lord who is the strongest. The number of strength goes from one to nine, not nine to one. His form once again dissolved into the air, and Kenpachi felt hot breath against the shell of his ear. So by that logic that makes me the strongest. The combat captain spun around, lashing out with his sword in a horizontal swing, only to hit nothing but air. Naruto was standing, calm and serene, watching as the tip of the jagged blade passed mere millimeters away from the bridge of his nose. In a blur he was within Zaraki's defenses, and with a face which showed no emotion, hit his opponent with a simple palm thrust to the chest. It was enough to send the 11th Division captain flying through the air, impacting against a dune with enough force to kick up a mass of sand. Naruto felt a sudden shift in the air, and bringing up his right hand, caught the blade of another's Anpakuto, this one belonging to Kachiki, who had decided to perform one of his signature Shunpo combinations. The blonde grinned as he looked up at the 6th Division captain. Senka, huh? Yuzumaki tilted his head, grin not leaving. A special Shunpo technique where one moves to their opponent's back, aiming for the Saketsu and Hakusui points, and sealing an opponent's spiritual pressure with a single stroke. It is so fast that most victims aren't aware whether they've been stabbed in the front or the back, right? How do you know this? I fraught an opponent who utilized that same technique. Naruto's grin became vicious. It cost him dearly when he tried to use it against me a second time. In the blink of an eye Bayakui was flying, smashing into the ground hard and skidding to a halt. The supposed Lord of Waco Mundo stood impassive, right leg held up as if imitating a high kick. He took a deep breath and brought the leg down again, smirk returning. I remember captains being tougher than this. He spun as a trident-like weapon with three serpentine blades passed by him. In a single fluent motion he continued his spin, bringing him across and behind the third and final captain, as he continued to lunge on his own momentum. Mayuri's eyes kept the blonde within sight before he too was felled by an open palm strike to his back. He was literally thrown off his feet, limbs flailing, hitting the ground several meters away, and skidding several more to a stop. Humph, young pups, Naruto scowled as he looked at his hand, curling it up into a fist as he flexed his muscles. There was a satisfying creak. The Kachiki had some finesse, but the other two lacked any tact. Suddenly the dune where he sent the first captain, exploded in a mass of released spiritual pressure, so much that it made the ninth lord look up and take notice. The spiritual pressure, visible as a mass of yellow suddenly made the blonde grin, and the maniacal, loud, howling laughter was like music to his ears. No tact, but a lot of energy to burn. Naruto grinned ferociously as he watched Kenpachi Zaraki. Looks like I judged a little too soon. This is more like a captain. Thank I. Naruto looked around in time to see a massive creature rise up from the desert sands. It reminded him of a caterpillar, except for the golden, bulbous head which looked an awful lot like a baby, with eyes without pupils or sclera, just dead whites, and purple marking, which looked like unshed tears under its eyes. A red cape was tied around its neck. A halo hovered over its head, and he heard a ringing of bells somewhere on its huge, terrifying visage. The voice of the 12th Division captain echoed through the huge fortress. Hanjiki Ashisogi Jism. Yes, Naruto's already ferocious grin warped into something monstrous. Yes, this is more like a captain. For the longest time she had slept through this hell, this nothing. Her last memory of freedom was flying, flying and fighting before she was soundly defeated. The woman scoffed at the word defeat, for her enemies had won by sheer force of numbers. One on one she could have taken any one of them, but three of them decided to fight her at once. The last thing she remembered of freedom was lying on the sand, beaten, bloodied and broken. The taste of copper was overwhelming in her mouth, her long hair cut free from its bindings, covering her face and the ground around her head like a messy halo. She wasn't able to lift her hand to defend herself. She had been spent, spent and defenseless as their leader, the strongest of them all had muttered the incantation, binding her to this confined space deep beneath the endless dunes she loved to run through. For the longest time she had tried to escape from this prison through sheer force. She would punch and kick and scream for long spans of time, until her throat was raw and her muscles protested even the slightest movement. She would wait until her strength returned before beginning the whole cycle over and over again. The most heart-wrenching memory though was how close she had come to making it to her strongest sibling's fortress, just out of his sight. If she had made it too within his gaze he would have come out and rescued her. The relationship between the two of them was a complicated one, as could be the same for the relationship between the group of individuals which were the nine lords. Together the two of them could have made a better fight of it. 
She knew that when he was finally defeated that he had hurt the enemy far more than she did, and even during those years where she fraught her imprisonment in vain that one fact gave her satisfaction. Eventually she just stopped trying and decided to sleep the millennia away until either she died or the seal failed. Time slipped past. She didn't know how much. Then she felt an unbridled power, and besides her body's protests she managed a weak smile. The Ninth Lord, her eldest and most powerful brother, had finally broken free from his cage in tremendous fashion, and as usual he had overdone it. She felt his power flow across the desert sands like a tsunami, and that feeling gave her hope which she had lost many eons ago. Then a powerful wave of his power swept across her seal, and she saw hairline cracks appearing before her. She looked at them for an eternity before a smile slowly spread across wrinkled flesh. The seal had been damaged by her sibling's release, and perhaps with just the right amount of pressure she could. She gathered her spiritual pressure, a great well of power which had not been used in millennia, but slowly built up until it was bursting at the seams. Three thousand years of power was at her fingertips, begging for a release. She took a deep breath and released. The blade of bubbling azure spiritual pressure exploded from the largest sand dune for countless kilometers around, sliding up and piercing the cloudless sky like a blade. Hollows all around felt the sudden power and fled in a panic. She stood wobbling in the center of the sand dune, which had been crushed and turned into a crater beneath her shriveled feet. The old woman, dressed in rags with long scraggly hair pooling onto the sand, looked around, took a deep breath, and released her spiritual pressure to its fullest. Her appearance changed. The long scraggly white hair immediately became healthy, turning light blonde before being cut by a simple flick of her wrist. What remained was a mane of wild straw blonde hair which fell down to her lower back. Another flick of the wrist and the delicate strands tied across each other into a braid. Her skin changed from flaccid wrinkles to pale, unblemished and toned skin. The rags just giving her modesty changed to white and black clothes, pants, a high-collared jacket and mesh-armored shirt, which showed an impressive bust and hourglass figure. She stretched, emitting a feline purr of satisfaction as she felt every muscle protest and bones pop to the movement after several thousand years of misuse. That done she looked in the direction of the spiritual pressure and with a smile took off in that direction. After three thousand years of imprisonment Ujido Nai was free. Dusting his hands off with an audible sigh Naruto looked over the partially destroyed landscape and at the two panting captains standing before him. Kenpachi Zaraki was taking in huge gulps of air, but he was still grinning like a madman and was still holding onto his sword. Mayuri Kuritsuchi was doubling over in pain, left arm blown away up to the shoulder and blood pooling onto the pale sand. His bankai was still active and was even now disgorging a mass of strange colored mist from its mouth. The mad scientist grit his teeth as he fraught through the pain and with a snap of his wrist, sent Kanjiki Ashisogi Jism on a collision course, smashing through the sands with its mouth open and disgorging even more poisonous gases. Naruto tilted his head to the side, pondering, before shrugging his shoulders and straightening his right hand. He brought his hand up in a vertical slashing motion, as if the limb were a broadsword which he was wielding. A blade of condensed crimson lashed out across the landscape, cutting Kanjiki Ashisogi Jism perfectly in half in a mass of flying blood and ripped apart cartilage. The blade didn't stop with the Bankai either, but continued on towards the two captains hiding behind it. Pinpachi saw it coming and dodged to the side, but Mayuri wasn't as lucky. He was barely able to move to his right before the blade sliced off another chunk of flesh from his hip all the way up to the muscles between his shoulder and neck. The mad captain screamed in agony, before leveling a hated glare at the vast Olard, who so effortlessly ripped through his bankai. Damn you, he growled through gnashing teeth. Curse you, you insect. Do you really think this is the end of me? Do you truly believe you have won? If I'm an insect, a voice from behind him spoke, causing the mad captain to freeze, eyes widening as the form before them just disintegrated into dust. Then I would guess I'm a spider, and you're a delicate little fly caught in my web. He spun around just in time for a straightened hand to pierce through his chest and exit his back in a shower of blood. He was just able to see the blonde-haired vast Olord grin victoriously at him before he blacked out. With no effort he snapped his arm, sending the now limb body colliding hard with the ground. Come to my web said the spider to the fly. Naruto didn't give the prone body another look. Instead he set his sights on the second captain who had challenged him. Kenpachi was grinning in an insane manner which would match his own wicked grin, and his unsheathed sword was leaning against his broad right shoulder. Aren't you going to run? Naruto asked dryly with a raised brow. Nah, the captain replied nonchalantly with a shrug of his shoulders. But you could if you want to, don't let me stop you. Naruto should have taken that as an offense, but instead his grin widened until it stretched from ear to ear. You are definitely my favorite brand of person to fight, a shitload of energy, and not even remotely afraid of death. His grin was mirrored by the towering man, Death, who gives a shit about death. I'm in heaven right now, my own personal nirvana. I've finally met someone worthy of fighting. 
The spiritual pressure exploded then, a mass of yellow flames that seemed to sap all light from the surrounding sky. Naruto looked up with a feral grin as this man's spiritual pressure gave birth to the form of a screaming human skull. I'm honored, but why don't you release your Shikai, or better yet your Bankai, and then we can really get this party rolling. Shikai, Bankai. Zaraki asked before throwing his head back and laughed hard. I would love to, sadly my sword isn't very talkative, don't even know the bastard's name. Damn man, that really blows. The blonde replied. All of this power without even knowing the name of your sword. Why don't you go away, learn your sword's name and then come back and face me. I would even clear my schedule for such a confrontation. Nah I ain't a type of guy to just back down and run away, not when there's such a strong guy to kill. As if to amplify his statement he lashed out with his sword, and a tide of spiritual pressure exploded from the blade, heading straight towards his foe. Naruto watched a blade of energy closing in without batting an eye, and with a simple swipe of his hand deflected it. The yellow blade of energy hit and exploded against a large dune, sending sand flying. Um, Naruto muttered as he shook his hand. That actually stung a little. I like you man, I really like you, and as a gift for actually making me feel a little pain, I will face you on even terms. He reached out with his right hand, and a sheathed katana came into being, almost as if it was born from the air itself, and what a beautiful weapon it was. The hilt and sheath were covered in crisscrossed black and crimson cloth, two strands flailing in the wind. The hilt was shaped like a curved shuriken, and the blade radiated power. He gripped the weapon with both hands, one on the hilt while the other was on the sheath, and slowly drew the weapon with a scrape of metal. The blade seemed to be made of liquid silver, shining magnificently in the daylight. Zaraki laughed with barely contained glee. The weapon had its own power, seemingly doubling his opponent's spiritual pressure just by being unsheathed. It was beautiful. It was magnificent. It was completely and utterly ruthless. Bubbling crimson spiritual pressure slid along the vast lord's form and his sword, and when the creature opened his eyes, they had gone from brilliant azure to bloody crimson, slit pupils, and even the whites of his eyes bled black. He spoke, voice a guttural growl which held nothing but utter bloodthirsty joy and mirth. You ready? Then Pachi Zaraki grinned like a madman, gripping his nameless Ampakudo in a two-handed grip, mirrored perfectly by his opponents. Yellow and crimson spiritual pressures were already pushing against each other, draining the surrounding area of all light and life, a true battle between titans. Oh yes. They walked a few steps and then increased their pace to a jog, then a run. In perfect synchrony the two old combatants raised their swords above their heads, ready for downward strokes. Feral grins mirrored on their faces and immortalized in their memories. Then they were upon each other, and in a flash both swords came crashing down. The release of spiritual pressure from the combined strikes was enormous, an explosion which flattened dunes and destroyed surrounding structure. The yellow and crimson spiritual pressures mixed and merged in a beautiful cacophony of unbridled destruction. When the dust cleared the land for a hundred meters in every direction, had turned into a colossal crater with the two combatants in the center. Their backs were to each other, easily three to four steps apart, grins still held on each of their faces, hands still gripping their katana in basic kendo stances. Seconds passed before the victor was shown. Kenpachi Zaraki, captain of the 11th Shinigami Court Guard Division, fell to his knees, a diagonal slash carved along his chest. Blood dribbled down the corners of his mouth, but his grin held. Beaten ha. Huh? The blonde didn't answer for the longest time, yay. But not dead. I don't want you to die. Naruto replied as he turned around, relaxing his stance and removing the blood from his sword with a simple flick of his wrist. The crimson liquid spattered against the flattened sand. I want you to leave this place and get stronger, learn Shikai, learn Bankai, come back here and face me again. Zaraki laughed, spitting out a large gob of blood. I look forward to it. He fell face first onto the sand. Naruto looked down at his fallen opponent and grinned, yay, me too. He walked, leaving his fallen foe behind, scaling the small hills of the crater in a matter of moments. Once he was on flat land again he looked around, searching for his next target. That was two captains down, but where was the third? His blow couldn't have been that serious. Bankai. Ah, there he was. Darkness fell and blades slid from said darkness, as if they were piercing the surface of a still pond. He could make out the ripples as they expanded and merged. The blades which rose to the infinite black reminded him of an honor guard or a funeral procession. He turned to lock eyes with the Kachiki, who held his now bladeless hilt in front of his chest in a military-like salute. Tsunbanza Kurakagayashi. Bankai, Naruto let the word leave his tongue, savoring the power it held, before allowing a grin to once again form, Bankai, yes, definitely the Bankai of a Kachiki. This is more like it. He fell into a stance, sword held in one hand, while the sheath formed on his other, held in a backwards grip. 
Naruto watched with rising respect as millions of cherry blossoms seemed to form from the air itself, all coming together in a single huge writhing mass, a stunning and nostalgic sight, reminding him of images of a beautiful girl with pink hair and dazzling green eyes. Yes, such a beautiful sight. It had been a while. 3000 years had indeed passed since he felt this presence, this aura, this power. It had been even longer since he had felt the suffocating layer of spiritual pressure descend on not just him but the whole of the domain, heck he would be surprised if the shockwaves of his release hadn't been felt at the other side of Waco Mundo. Yes, it had been a while. Then he had felt another familiar presence, breaking free soon after the shockwaves of the first had died down. He felt her power next, and knew that their long imprisonment was coming to an abrupt end. Like a row of dominoes falling one after the other, a true chain reaction on a large scale. He knew his time had come the moment he saw a crack appear on his seal, right before his eyes, as if he was watching a pane of glass slowly cave in under the pressure. With a single-aged hand he pressed against it and released. A golden pillar of spiritual pressure shattered the shell-shocked seal, and he rose from his sarcophagus. The sand answered his subconscious command, immediately swirling around him like a tornado of minuscule particles. His long white hair became dark red, skin tightened and firmed, limbs regained old muscles long lost to misuse and decay. Basic clothes covered his once rag-covered form, a simple white shirt, scarf and pants all flowing with the gale force winds. He reached out with his spiritual pressure, feeling a total of six additional presences. One was unmistakably his sister, racing towards the epicenter. The other five were all clumped together in the direction of the old fortress. Three were Shinigami, low to mid-captain level, another felt strange, like a mixture of Shinigami and Hollow, and the final one felt like a Hollow, definitely his brother by the way he kept his spiritual pressure contained. He always held back against the enemy. The Lord took a deep breath and allowed the tornado to subside. Ara opened his eyes and looked over the desert sands of Waco Mundo, before taking off in a blur of motion, so fast dust rose from where he treaded. He felt his sister already on the move, well ahead of him in her traveling to the source of the disturbance which had freed them. Only one person was so powerful that he could accidentally undo ancient seals. Naruto was up and about and was in the middle of a brawl. The strange bastard eye's presence was already dormant, meaning he had been beaten into unconsciousness, and while he was running he felt one of the Shinigami fall dormant as well. The Ninth Lord had already incapacitated two of his four opponents. There was defeating an enemy and then there was just showing off. Maybe if he increased his speed he could make it before his brother destroyed everything. That was doubtful though. His sister had a good head start, too good for him to beat. Once she got there the two of them would completely annihilate whoever the enemy was. His memories of the time when he was sealed were sketchy. All he recalled was facing a small group of men wearing black Shihakusho uniforms with katana strapped to their sides. He had attempted to fight but was surprised and quickly surrounded. All he remembered was pain and agony as his strength was sealed, then he was left there, seeing all around him fall into anarchy while he was unable to stop it. Waco Mundo went to the dogs the moment their guiding hands were removed. Their last few children had slowly died off one after the other, leaving behind mindless hollows who went as they pleased. In time it seemed that the evolutionary chain would slowly create replacements, but that never happened. That would soon change. But first he needed to expel the Shinigami from this place, and as he felt the second Shinigami presence go dark, he knew the action would be over before he arrived, by how quickly his brother was knocking around his opponents, he considered it might be over even before his sister arrived. Or maybe not, the last one felt strong. Ara smiled. It was a good day to be free, a very good day. His speed was phenomenal. The mass of pink blossoms would rise up like a great maw, ready to devour this human form hollow within its bladed depths. Ayakuya Kachiki, captain of the Sixth Company, stood in the center of a tattered hurricane of cherry blossoms, feet spread, body coiled, white scarf billowing in the wind, and hands outstretched, as if he were signaling his bankai where to go, where to strike, and Sinbansa Kurakagayashi followed his commands without hesitancy, flowing like a beautiful writhing cloud of death. The Ninth Lord watched this display as he moved faster than the eye could detect, faster than anything Hueco Mundo had ever seen in millennia. Every time it looked like the swarm of pink petals were about to envelope him, he would vanish from their grasp and reappear a safe distance away, feet not once touching the ground since the battle began. He was a wraith, a phantom, a ghost in the eternally dark skies. He was too fast for this Bankai to catch, even with every elaborate trap the Kachiki pulled from his impressive arsenal. Every trap was quickly and efficiently evaded. Yet every time the Lord attempted to strike the cherry blossoms would retreat and rise in defense of their wielder, creating an impenetrable wall which cut any who attempted to break through. 
it reminded Naruto of his fellow sibling Gara's ultimate defense of sand, except instead of this defense piercing or crushing the attacker, it sliced almost microscopic cuts into the skin, and if one was caught and swallowed by this Bankai, then there was no chance of coming out of it unscathed. He reappeared 20 meters above the ground, ducking a scythe-shaped mass of petals, sidestepping another, and then disappearing in another sonido, when the real cloud of danger presented itself. He blurred above it, outstretched hand already firing a mid-level zero into the crimson swarm. They scattered like a shoal of fish would a predator, reforming and coming at him again. Naruto blurred, climbing another 20 feet in less than a millisecond before firing a stronger zero, watching as the outcome remained the same. This stalemate between them was becoming troublesome. He spun around, stretching his hand out to fire yet another zero at the wielder, watching as the mass of cherry blossoms representing Senbonsakura Kagayashi rose up in defense of their master. Naruto tilted his head, grinning slightly as he held out his hand and allowed his sword, this time completely unsheathed to appear on his palm. He coiled his body slightly before swinging the weapon in a wide arc, the movement creating a blade of bubbling crimson spiritual pressure to lance forth. The blade slammed into the defense, and for a moment the amassed petals seemed to almost buckle, before the energy behind the attack gave out. A little more power and he should be able to pierce it. The Sakura petals surrounded and encompassed him then, using his distraction to take full advantage. They sliced through his skin and clothing like thousands of razor-sharp blades, cutting and hacking and slicing. There was an explosion of blood and gore which covered the white sands, and through it all he heard the Kachiki's voice. You underestimated me, Yuzumaki Naruto. Oh, he replied, now 30 meters above the now startled Kachiki, hands together to keep hold of the monumental power of a Grand Ray Zero. The ultimate Zero sparked and writhed in his hands, its electric blue light so different from the usual dark crimson. Within moments he had compressed this ultimate strike into a small ball no larger than his hand before throwing it the same way one would throw a baseball. I don't know about that. Ayakuya Kachiki raised his hand, and Senbonsakura Kagayashi answered his call with impressive speed, amassing into a thick wall of a thousand cherry-colored petals, just as the fist-sized ball impacted. In that moment the energy released, but there was no sound of an explosion, just a piercing white light that sapped the darkness away. When the light finally faded by Akuya Kachiki stood, arms held in front of him, palms of his hands charred and smoking. The writhing mass of his bankai in front of him were nothing more than a burning mass of dead black petals falling to the sands. His stony expression remained in place though, and the Ninth Lord had to give him respect for not letting his pain show. Hmm, maybe next time I should add a little more power to it. Naruto mused as the Shinigami captain made a chopping motion with his hand, and the swarm of petals began their attack anew, only faster. Their sudden burst of speed surprised the hollow before he used his own blurring speed to get out of the way. So if he uses his hands his attacks are twice as fast. Naruto muttered, reappearing 30 meters away and seeing that the blades were still coming, getting faster with each moment. If this kept up the petals would eventually get him, and he couldn't have that. He performed yet another sonido, this time using all of his speed and agility. Ayakuya's eyes shifted to look behind him when he felt the hollow spiritual pressure reappear, no warning and no trail. He simply vanished from sight and reappeared, so fast that he might as well have teleported. His sword was in his hand again, which was held in preparation for a horizontal arc. Sorry boy, but this is the end game. The Kachiki spun around just as Naruto swung his sword, reaching out with his hand to catch the blade, which left a light gash along his palm, blood flowed from the wound, coating the blade and dripping from his hand. Naruto frowned as he looked on, confused, before he felt the spiritual pressure of his opponent double, and then triple. Quickly he jumped back, landing in a crouch, sword still in hand. Uzumaki Naruto, known as the Ninth Lord, but also the firstborn King of Foxes, Grand Emperor of Hollows and Keeper of Waco Mundo. It is said that your power is capable of leveling mountains and creating devastating tsunamis, an unstoppable force, and an unmovable object all in one. Azure Blue met Dark Brown and held. I can see that the stories are true if you are capable of fighting me even when my Bankai is released, but that ends here. Once again the thousands upon thousands of pink petals rose up, but this time not in defense of their master and not to attack him, instead they collided together, forming a huge dome around the two combatants before disintegrating and reforming all around them into a truly awe-inspiring sight, one that Naruto knew he would never forget until his dying breath. Swords. Hundreds of swords. Line after line of swords, creating from the innumerable mass of Sakura petals came into existence, forming together to form the very dome-like object he saw at the beginning. Each sword had the basic design of a well-crafted katana, and the power emanating from each of them was truly impressive, not something to be struck with. These swords surrounded the two combatants in four rows, one on top of the other. For the first time in this fight the Ninth Lord wondered if he was capable of dodging them all. 
Senkei Senbanzakura Kagayashi, the Kachiki declared, reaching out with his bloodied hand in time to catch the handle of one of these blades. The pink spiritual pressure condensed before becoming an exact replica of the same sword the Shinigami used before he released his Bankai, a beautifully crafted blade, simple in its craftsmanship. This is what happens to Senbanzakura when I completely change my strategy from defense to completely killing my enemy. You are the third person to ever see this stage. Naruto was now completely serious, all traces of mirth gone as he continued to stare into the Kachiki's unyielding gaze. I am honored, truly. I might really have to work to be able to dodge all of these blades. Don't worry, the Shinigami replied with a simple shake of his head. These 1000 blades are simply your funeral procession. They will not attack you all at once. Good to hear, Naruto grinned, pointing his sword right at the waiting form of Kachiki Baikuya. Let's get started then. Both vanished in a duo of blurs, coming together in a speed too quick for the eye to make out, sparks flew as the two blades met with a fierce velocity, bubbling crimson and calm blue, battling each other for control of the space, just as their two masters continued the battle. It wasn't hard to follow his spiritual pressure, even someone completely unable to sense such things would be aware of the ominous aura which filled the air. Lost notches had changed, was the first thing Yujito realized as she raced across the sands at almost ten times the speed of sound. The once modest yet aesthetically pleasing fort had been replaced by a huge and gaudy dome, tall spires stabbing out, as if trying to pierce the sky. She smiled thinly, knowing full well that her eldest and strongest sibling would not be pleased with such a drastic change from his ancient castle. He was never one to live in such massive creations. Naruto had always considered his fortress to be the home of himself and his chosen. At its height his home had been as large as a small settlement, but this thing was large enough to be considered a city. Then again the differences in their opinions was radical, while Naruto enjoyed a grounded place for him to live, it was a different story for Yujito. The second lord had always been a wanderer from the day she regained her mind, until the day she was imprisoned in that coffin of Sekiseki Rock, traveling the endless deserts of Waco Mundo with her chosen. She hopped, skipped and then jumped, soaring through the Ritsu thick air over the large fortress, and looking down at what she saw from her bird's eye view. There had been quite the battle inside this fortress, such a battle that it had spilled into the outside world. The huge crevice-shaped scar running along the top of the dome was proof of this, as was the black scorch marks and Rekage. The scent of discharged spiritual pressure, both Shinigami and Hollow-like was thick in the air, almost palpable to her still recovering senses. Ijido's feline eyes looked down through the broken ceiling to see nothing but white desert sand, a few structures of Sekiseki rock scattered about, but other than that it was sand. What was the point in building such a huge structure when most of its interior was left barren? Shrugging her shoulders the blonde was about to dive through the hole. Naruto seemed to be having a little trouble with the last Shinigami, not surprising, considering the buffoon went to battle the moment he broke from his seal. Yujito had broken out of hers a few moments after him, and she guessed her power was only at around 50% of what it had been. The same could be said for her eldest brother, because she had felt him destroy opponents with twice the spiritual pressure of the one he was currently fighting. Drastically she changed her course, bringing her in a steep dive towards the opening between outside world and interior of fortress. She shot through the hole without a second thought and came to an abrupt stop 20 meters down, surveying the area before looking up at the ceiling, frowning as she did. The landscape was a mess of cratered ground and half-destroyed structure, dispensed spiritual pressure hung in the air like a repressive cloud, barely contained by the now-breached shell of Sekiseki rock surrounding the fortress. She looked up and frowned, noticing that the interior surface of the barrier was made to look like a daytime sky in either the human world or the soul society, complete with the white wisps of clouds. Forgetting about the surrounding scenery she submerged herself in the spiritual pressure, searching through the masses of alien presences until she found the one she was looking for, the only familiar spiritual pressure in this fortress. She was away like a shot, moving beyond the speed of sound to become nothing more than a shapeless blur as she tore through the landscape until she found her destination. What she saw was a domed object, quite large and as dark as the darkest abyss, yet she felt the clashing spiritual pressures of the Ninth Lord and the Shinigami captain battling within. With a gliding finesse she stepped on a large flat piece of debris several dozen meters away, testing its weight to make sure it was well grounded into the sand before sitting down to wait. Knowing her elder like she did Yujito was sure he would not appreciate her intervention. He was just the kind of person who wished to fight his own battles himself and not get others involved unless it was a moment of absolute necessity. So she sat down and waited, leaning back to lie on the flat slab and enjoy the small things about being free. She missed this feeling, the touch of the wind. Naruto brought his blade down with such force that it sliced straight through the Ritsu-made blade of the Shinigami captain, the weapon disintegrating in shards of pink light. Baikui was forced to flash away from his opponent, raising his hand to allow yet another sword to soar into his waiting fist. 
a flick of his wrist and four more fell with blurring speed, three missed the blonde-haired Bastolard, but the fourth hit its mark, missing his leg, but impaling into his right foot. The hollow ground his teeth, yet pulled the blade out and threw it away with swiftness. Bayakuya had to admit he was impressed by the hollow's pain threshold, especially with his Bankai in this advanced stage. Zenbanza Kurakagayashi not only turned his spiritual pressure into blades, but also increased their potential power significantly. Anyone less would have lost a foot. But he was wearing the Lord down, managing to hit him with blade after blade of spiritual pressure, most of the wounds were superficial, deep cuts and stabs to non-vital areas, but he was definitely wearing the hollow down. Another Shunpo brought him face to face with the Hollow Lord, and just as the two blades met by Akuya brought his free hand up, catching the falling blade with ease and plunging it into the Hollow's leg. Naruto hissed in pain, finally falling to a knee, but was still fast enough to bring his sword up to block Kachiki's swing. He saw his chance and forming a Siro with his free hand, slammed it into the Shinigami's torso, watching with a grim look as it shredded through clothing, skin, bone cartilage and organs with frightening ease. A beam of dark crimson exploded from the Shinigami's back, blasting through the dark shell and into the upper atmosphere of Las Notches. The only problem was that there was no body anymore, the Shinigami just seemed to be there one moment and gone the next. Naruto saw this coming, knowing that there was no way a Shinigami of this man's caliber would fall so easily. He knew the man was behind him, unharmed from that deadly point-blank strike, ready to pierce him. Naruto vanished from sight courtesy of a Sunido, reappearing behind the stoic captain, yet he found himself once again face to face with him. A finger was pressing against the nap of his neck, and the Ninth Lord was aware of him uttering a few words. Add him for by Akurai. The bolt of condensed lightning pierced straight through Naruto's collarbone, exploding forth much the same way as his Siro did before. The blast pierced the eternal black walls before dissipating in Las Notch's upper atmosphere. Naruto staggered back, hacking and gasping before vanishing from sight. Ayakuya's eyes widened at the empty space before falling back to their bored norm. He knew exactly where the hollow would attack from, and with the briefest of glances, five blades came rushing down from the funeral column surrounding them. He heard the sounds of metal piercing flesh and several grunts of pain. He turned to see the Ninth Lord bent over, gasping for air as blood ran unimpeded down his frame, dousing his clothing in the crimson liquid. Each of the five blades had hit their mark with armor-piercing force. The first went right into his shoulder blade, biting deeply enough to break through the bone and into his body, another in his back, another piercing straight through his left leg, another into his right foot down to the hilt, and finally the fifth blade through his abdomen, at an angle, exiting above his tailbone. I am amazed that you can still stand, most would be dead from those wounds, Bayakuya stated in his same stoic tone, raising his hand to allow a sixth blade to soar into it. He leveled the weapon, bladed tip against Naruto's throat. This is the end. You have indeed proved yourself as a lord of Waco Mundo, go to your grave knowing that. He stopped short when he heard it, beginning as a croak from the hollow's throat, it slowly morphed into a chuckle, then a laugh, then a howl of laughter, blood spattered from his mouth, yet he did not seem to care. He rose up, his crimson life fluid dyeing the sand at his feet red with blood. I'm disappointed in myself. Naruto stated as he finally calmed down. I honestly thought I could go longer than this, but I suppose I don't have a choice. I'll give you a parting gift Shinigami, but be mindful of my warning. The whisker-like scars on his cheeks became dark and ominous, looking more like crevices. His canines elongated into full fangs, glistening and sharper than a razor. His fingernails snapped and elongated into wickedly sharp claws. It was his eyes that caught Bayakuya's attention. When he opened his eyes they weren't the azure blue he had become accustomed to. They became vulpine, scleromorphing to the color of blood. Pupils becoming sharp sickles and black seemingly bleeding into the whites of his eyes. Only the spirit king has seen this form and lived, his voice was a guttural snarl, beyond human or hollow, and the spiritual pressure became visible as a cloak of bubbling crimson. Rip the world asunder. First there was the power, permeating the very air. Doubling. Tripling. Quadrupling. Ejido smiled as nostalgia hit her, and breathed it in as if it were much needed oxygen. How long had it been since she felt this? How long since she felt this unbridled strength? This hidden power whose reserves were deeper than the deepest oceans. This hidden power whose reserves were higher than the highest mountains. This hidden power which would make even a god stand up and take notice. How long has it been since you last released your true form? She asked, knowing no one would be there to hear her, but saying it just the same. She took another deep breath and released a sigh of contentment, leaning back and allowing her hands to take her weight. How long since you looked up to the heavens themselves and roared your defiance? The dome of blackness, which held her eldest brother and his Shinigami adversary, rippled as if it were the surface of a still lake, then cracks began to form along its frame, small at first, but quickly growing longer and thicker like a pane of glass whose stress level was surpassed. The explosion which followed was magnificent. 
The dome of spiritual pressure blew apart, sending rapidly dissipating shards and debris of spiritual pressure in every direction. Ujido moved fluidly, almost naturally, performed a backflip, and crouching behind the flattened slab of Sekiseki, as the missiles of debris soared and zipped past her. One large piece, growing smaller with every moment, vanishing like sand thrown into the air, slammed against the exact spot where she sat but a moment ago, and continued its journey a bare half-meter over her head. Smiling with glee she looked over her protective barrier in a small hub to see him, the true him. The white smoke obscured all view, but it was quickly blown away to show a huge crater where the battle had been played out. Yujito hopped, skipped and then jumped high, landing in a graceful motion right at the edge of the crater, no, more like a ravine. She saw but a glimpse of his true form. Nine long, sinewy tails flailed in the wind before disintegrating the very same way as the destroyed remnants of the Shinigami Bankai had vanished but a scant few moments before. The smoke gave way enough for her to see a lean muscular body encased in white carapace armor, which disintegrated much the same way as his nine magnificent tails. The Shinigami lay on his side several meters away. His back was to her. His black shahakusha was torn and ragged, and his zanpakuto was ripped from his grasp and was slowly regenerating to its sealed form several meters from the severely wounded death god's reach. He was still alive, Yujito noticed. Naruto, now fully back in his sealed state, minus his clothes, looked a little sheepish as his eyes fell upon the fallen Shinigami. Yujito noticed that he had completely regenerated everything on his exceptional frame, from his leanly muscled shoulders and strong arms to his six-pack stomach and strong legs. She quickly took a peek to his nether regions, oh yes, everything was regenerated quite nicely. Hmm, I guess I overdid it. He walked over to the unmoving Shinigami and lightly tapped him with his bare foot. You ain't dead are you? She heard the Shinigami cough, spitting out a glob of blood before undoubtedly leveling a glare at the strongest hollow alive. Naruto didn't look nervous or scared by the glare, not in the slightest. If anything he grinned. There you go. You're just chock full of piss and vinegar. What are you waiting for, the Shinigami asked in a severe cold tone. You defeated me, so kill me. Naruto actually seemed to think about that. Nah, too easy, instead I'm just going to toss you back to where you belong with a message to your commander. I'm guessing it's that old bastard Yamamoto, right? How do you know him? He was a little fidgeting vice captain of the king's court last time I saw him. Naruto replied, though his voice didn't contain a trace of nostalgia nor mirth, if anything it was as cold as ice and twice as deadly. I have to find and beat the crap out of him. He hurt someone I deeply care for see, and I can't allow him to just get by without one of her elder siblings, giving him the beating of his life. Ujido was in complete agreement, if Naruto wasn't able to then she would gladly take over that assignment. If she was not able to she knew another six people who would gladly take the role. Boy, Naruto. His head snapped in her direction, and his shock was immediately replaced by a grin, a full genuine grin which made her blush. Yu-chan. You're up early. She was about to reply, but before she could muster any sort of retort he flashed over to her, caught her and hugged her in a tight fierce embrace. The movement was so sudden and unexpected that she lost her footing, about to fall to the ground with him clinging to her, but he moved quicker, spinning around in midair, so he would hit the ground and she would land softly on him. They both landed with a small pillow of sand. Your real sight for sore eyes, he said, kissing her a quick peck on the cheek and then wrapping her in a tighter embrace. I missed you kitten. Her rebuke died in her throat, indignant expression replaced by a soft, tender smile, as she wrapped her arms around him and leaned her head against his chest, listening to his steady, rhythmic heartbeat. It had always had a calming effect on her, ever since he found her alone and half-dead in the desert, a sign that they were above and beyond the hollows which they evolved from. I missed you to Kit. They were like that for a while, both happy with nothing more than being in each other's company after so many millennia alone, both lost in the moment and happy to remain lost. Then it all ended. Are you the only one up? An explosion, followed by a pillar of sand, answered the question for her. Yujito looked up with narrowing eyes and a frown, while Naruto leaned back with a quizzical expression which slowly morphed into a full-blown grin. Gara appeared in the center of the tornado as it dispersed and dissipated, looking down at the two of them with a quizzically raised brow. Interrupt something, did I? Yujito saw through his question a few moments sooner than Naruto and gave a mischievous, sexy smirk. Why yes, as a matter of fact. So if you would push off for a few moments we'll get all of this pent-up tension out of the way. Naruto didn't get it for a moment, and then he looked down to see that he was still naked. Ah, I see. Give me a moment. The blonde smirk turned into a slightly disappointed pout as she got off of him, maybe later. Naruto rose, giving her a look which had a definite affirmative to it before snapping his fingers. A pair of baggy dark green pants and chainmail black shirt formed over his form, black sandals seemingly forming from the sand itself. 
A long trench coat of eternal black was next to form, with black flames licking the hem and cuffs in a mass of reds, oranges and yellows. The blonde smirked as he looked it over, thoroughly more satisfied with his new choice of attire than the dreary white and black he had made spur of the moment before. Much better, Naruto whooped as he cracked his neck muscles. If anyone wants to change their colors now would be the best time. Ujido was the first to change. She did nothing with her clothes physically, the baggy pants, chainmail shirt and thick bomber jacket remained the same, but the color changed from whites and blacks to a deep dark azure with black trim. The chainmail became a chrome shade of gray, and her sandals knee-high black boots took on a shade of shimmering black, completing her look. Ara didn't even move as his clothes changed color. The white and black buttoned shirt pants and boots changing color to a dark maroon with navy blue and faded green trim. His boots became the same shade of black as polished leather. A huge tan gourd, his own personal choice of weapon, appeared on his back, held in place by straps and satchels. Sand rose from the sand, flowing into the container until it was full, then a cork materialized from the air and plugged the gourd shut. Naruto grinned. Ujito grinned. Even Gara allowed a small smile to grace his features. Ready to go to war, Naruto asked. Definitely, Ujito agreed. I could use some exercise, Gara allowed. There was a snarl, followed by the sound of a huge fist hitting the earth. All three lords turned to see the giant of Asiro Espada, slowly rising to his feet, regaining his senses at long last. Naruto scowled at the creature, before turning back to Gara. sorry for asking this, but could you deal with him? The first lord looked at him for a moment before shrugging and taking a step forward, the cork of his gourd popped open and sand spilled out, mingling with the white grains at his feet. I suppose I can. That's the old emperor of the eternal sands I know. What about you two? Don't worry about us, Naruto grinned, even as a small explosion of kicked up dust and sand made the arrival of a newcomer all the more abundantly clear. We have a substitute. The dust and sand settled quickly, dissipating to show the wrinkled features of their newest awakened. Hair the color of dried blood and a beard, all shaggy and unkempt, was the first thing they noticed. His body was contained in a long sleeve dark purple shirt and baggy pants of the same color. He also wore what looked like armor, a glistening black breastplate and gauntlets. Brashi, Naruto greeted with a vicious grin. You're up earlier than I thought old man. Brashi, fourth lord, grinned back, just as vicious, just as brutal. Couldn't have you young upstarts having all the fun, could I? I suppose not, Naruto replied before turning around as if to look at absolutely nothing. Hmm, someone's been messing with the Garganta. With lightning quickness his right hand seemed to pierce through the very air itself and twist sharply in a clockwise motion of a full 90 degrees. There was a moment of silence, and then the gateway between Hueco Mundo and the human world opened. An outline in the air beside Naruto, appearing as a black mouth with molar teeth opened up beside him, easily big enough for all four of the lords to walk through with room for their personal space. Naruto nodded to himself before turning to Gara. you can handle him right. The first lord gave him a withering glare. Alright then, try and finish him off quickly. Naruto grinned viciously. We'll try and leave a few survivors for you. Then they were gone. The ninth, fourth and second lords stepped through the garganta and continued on, even as the gateway closed up behind them. Gara eyed the space for a few moments before turning, but full attention back to the most powerful of the Espada, who was now fully lucid and glaring down upon him with bloodshot eyes. Gara sighed. The sand around him arose anew as a twisting, swirling tornado of will and power. His own spiritual pressure mingled and mixed with the very fabric of the sands all around him, and the First Lord took a deep breath as he savored every moment of his reconnection to the endless white sands of Hueco Mundo. Let's make this quick, shall we? It was a good day to be free. The giant roared a thunderous sound which shook the very landscape with its great power. Gara had to admit that he was impressed that a hollow who had torn off his mask had gained so much strength. It was definitely nothing to laugh at. You're wasting your time. He sighed to himself. Once these sands are under my control they can become as soft as a feather or as strong as steel. His body up to his waist was encased in sand, burying his legs and stopping him from moving any closer or farther away from him. His huge clawed hands had suffered a similar fate, encased in sand all the way up just past his elbows. Yami continued to struggle, but it was a wasted effort. There was nothing that could break through the sand when he put his full concentration into it. Only Naruto, Karabi and Fu had the raw power to do it. The mammoth Aranker opened his maw a small dark red ball of a zero forming on the tip of his tongue. He fired, a powerful blast which appeared to suck the color from the area, turning it into a mass of white light. The resulting blast left a mushroom-shaped cloud forming in the exact place where Gara had stood, rising higher and higher, until it almost touched the scarred ceiling of the fortress. Take that, trash. No answer, not for a few seconds, it took several tense moments. Then the cloud cleared. The light returned to normal, leaving the blackened sand of ground zero laid out before him. 
There was just one problem. Where the first lord once stood was a sphere made out of pure blackened sand, easily large enough to fit someone of his size into. The outer layer of sand was blackened by the strike, the surface sand burned to the point where it became jagged pieces of glass. The bowl opened as a flower would bloom, and sitting cross-legged on the platform was his opponent, completely unharmed, and had the appearance of someone who was in a light meditation or sleep. The red-haired hollow opened his eyes, green orbs looking over the battleground right into the widened eyes of his opponent. Finished already? He asked, voice a bored drawl as he spoke. The platform of sand descended, seemingly merging with the greater desert before he stood up, dusted himself off and set a bored gaze upon the strongest of the espada. As I have said power means nothing here, as long as I am here, surrounded by sand I cannot be defeated. Not even the ninth lord was able to defeat me on my home ground. He stretched his hands out, and the sand exploded all around him into two streams of white, flowing around him like a miniature hurricane, faster and faster until they became blurs, then faster and faster, until they formed a miniature twister. The sand streams dissipated, forming into a tornado of sand, ready to become a storm at the mental thought of its creator. If you are finished then I will begin. He pointed his right hand right at the espada's face, between the eyes. You probably won't survive this. Dammy just starred, eyes widened and filled with an emotion he had not known for a long time. What was it? Anxiety, dread, fear yes it was fear. Something blurred across the waists, appearing right in front of him and driving a two-footed dropkick into his chin, breaking his jaw and sending him falling to the ground with a monumental explosion of sand as his body came to a stop. The perpetrator was sent flying by the recoil, but used the momentum to curl up her body, performing a trio of flawless somersaults before straightening herself out to land perfectly on the ground, feet together and arms stretched either side of her. Vara frowned at the newcomer, allowing his sand to fall away from the now unconscious enemy. He was mine. You were taking too long. The woman replied dryly as she stood up and brushed a lock of turquoise green hair from her face. You've missed them, he replied, crossing his arms across his chest and starring right at the unwelcome presence of his sister. Naruto, Yujito and Rashi have already moved on. If you want to catch up with them I would suggest you go now and leave my prey to me. The woman smirked. Three thousand years in a coffin has done nothing in removing the stick from your ass, brother. And three thousand years have indulged your willpower in getting in the way of my duels, sister. He responded with a tired sigh. If you wish to catch up to them I would suggest you do so now. How long ago was that? Five minutes, he replied. She groaned in what could only be perceived as dismal disappointment. They're probably there by now. Then go before they kill everyone, Gar replied, lowering his head, closing his eyes and frowning in annoyance. You can't have that one. He is my prey. All right, all right, she hyped before turning around and opening a gargantua with a simple flick of her hand. It opened and she frowned. It feels stiff. Someone forced it shut, Gar explained. She always did this to him. Her childish exuberance to the point of borderline hyper always rubbed him the wrong way. Now please leave. Grumpy much, she muttered with a cheeky smile before stepping through the open portal. It closed slowly, and she turned around, bent over and gave him a little wave before it shut, leaving him alone once again with an unconscious opponent, again. Gara sighed, walked a few steps towards a slab of rock, sat down and watched his unconscious opponent with a hawk's gaze. He could wait, as long as no one got in the way. Again. Apache, Sun Sung, Mila Rose, she muttered their names as she turned her attention back to her opponent, a young child with cold eyes and snow-white hair, who wore the uniform of a captain. She looked down upon the smoking bodies of her three subordinates, unmoving where they fell far below, and she was unable to feel their Ritsu. You fought well. The young captain's eyes widened, showing his piercing crystal blue eyes as she undid all of the buttons of her shirt, showing the remnants of her hollow mask to the world, stretching from just below her nose to form a complete set of jaws, armor around her neck, and extending down to her breasts, to just keep her decency. She needed to end this battle quickly. She needed to gain revenge for her subordinates. Her focus now was to kill the one who had killed them, that old man who wore the mark of the first division of the Shinigami hierarchy. She had sensed other lives winking out across the field of battle which was the fake Karakura town. The Shinigami had decimated all of the Frachi and Baragan Luisenbern had taken with him into battle, and the second Espada was currently dueling a petite female Shinigami, with shoulder-length black hair. The first Espa, Coyote Stark, seemed to be skirmishing with another two Shinigami wearing captain's jackets, one with long dark hair done up in a ponytail, and the other with long white hair, both had dual swords. Neither of her superior's numbers had activated their Resurrection, but she would have to. Her opponent was strong, a match for her if she didn't get serious quickly. She may be one of the strongest, but she had no qualms with admitting that she was the weakest Espada in attendance. She accepted that, and that was why she had no problem releasing her Resurrection first. 
Destroy, she muttered, pointing the blade in front of her yet slightly down, keeping her eyes on the still astonished Shinigami captain, and declared her sword's name to him, Tiburon. A cyclone of water appeared to form from the air, enveloping her in its depths and reshaping to form a cocoon. She waited barely a few seconds for her change to complete, before cutting herself from it with a simple horizontal slice from her reformed lance-like blade, allowing the water to disperse and show him what she had become. Her clothes vanished. The remnants of her hollow mask had disintegrated from her face, reforming into a collar with extensions that still covered the nipples of her breasts. Knee-length white boots and elbow-length gloves came into existence, a spinal-like procession of bony protrusions formed vertically down her stomach from her breasts to just below her navel, two spalders appeared on her shoulders with long white ribbons, and her waist was covered with a line of bones resembling a miniskirt covering black undergarments. Her sword changed as well into a large weapon which resembled a shark's tooth, her hand protected by the guard. She struck with such speed that the young Shinigami didn't know what hit him until it was far too late. She cut through him with a diagonal stroke, barely aware of his widened, half-surprised half-horrified gaze before she blurred past him. The Aherable didn't give him a second glance as she turned her attention back to their leader, aware of the difference in power between them, but unwilling to back down. You, she said in a voice void of emotion, but her emerald eyes simmered with it. His gaze, those emotionless orbs irritated her. I will punish you for ending their lives. She felt him approach with just enough time to parry and watched with interest as that same young man who she thought she had cut down flew past her, the draconian wings of ice which represented his final release, his bankai, flapped as they brought him upright. She should have known that a captain would never go down so easy. Temporarily putting her revenge on hold she gave chase to the Shinigami, her own weapon at the ready. She was within 20 meters of him when she felt it and immediately peeled off to the side just in time to dodge the gargantua when it opened. Arable threw herself back, several dozen meters before stopping and surveying the opening portal to Hueco Mundo with astonishment. Lord Azen had sealed the access way. There was no way that anyone else could force it open. Then the voice came, a gravelly voice which echoed through the gargantua into the battlefield. It was so loud that it brought all of the combatants to a standstill. Even Lord Azen, imprisoned in the captain commander's flaming prison and his two Shinigami lieutenants, Jin Ichimaru and Kanem Tosin, looked over. If you two don't shut up I will turn us around and drop you off back home, the voice shouted in agitation. Do you understand? They walked out of the portal, seemingly unaware that every pair of eyes were staring right at them. There were three of them, walking in a formation similar to a V. In the lead was a tall man with spiky blonde hair, tanned skin, piercing ocean blue eyes and whisker-like streaks across his cheeks, whether they were tattoos or scars she was unsure. The two flanking him seemed as different as night a day. One was a woman who looked in the prime of her youth. The other was a man who looked near the end of his life. The woman was beautiful with long pale blonde hair tied into a braid by white cloth, pale white skin, slanted eyes which were a dark brown. She was curvaceous, even if the dark blue jacket she wore covered her upper body, the skin-tight jeans and leather boots showed her lower form off a little too well. The man was old, yet there was not a hint of grey in his cut short hair or goatee, which was both a deep maroon red, but his tanned skin showed the wrinkles of age, not as bad as the second Espada, but they still showed he seemed the oldest one of the trio. He was the shortest one as well, with a bulky build which contradicted the curvaceous build of the female or the physically fit, muscled form of the leading male. I'm not being forced back from this one kid, the old man growled before thumbing over to the female. But the blonde bimbo can go. Who are you calling a blonde bimbo, the female replied with a dangerous edge in her voice, you hairy, old, senile, baboon. I resent that, the old man snarled before giving himself a look over. I am not that hairy. I need a drink, the taller male muttered with urgency as he turned away from his bickering compatriots to have a look around. There is stuff that you two said that cannot be removed with anything but excessive amounts of alcohol. He then seemed to realize where they were, and the lead blonde took one long look around at the audience before smiling. What can I say, I can't take them anywhere. Arable watched on, bewildered, as he turned back to his compatriots who were still giving each other glares, which could probably melt steel. All right you two break it up, we're here. Really, the female said, voice dripping with sarcasm. I hadn't noticed. Not surprising with that head of hot air you have there, the old man muttered. Bite me ape. Enough, the leader said with slight annoyance as he raised his hand and snapped his fingers, bringing a high back throne of white marble with intricate carvings into existence. He sat on the throne, crossed his legs and leaned his head against his right hand. His two compatriots hesitated before stepping forward and calling identical thrones to levitate in midair by snapping their fingers. They both sat down and looked on. Take your pick, who do you want to fight? Parable felt it. Their confidence. Their conviction. Their power. Yet they did not feel like a rancor. 
they felt like hollows true hollows, like she herself felt to her senses when she was a vast lord, before she met Sasuke's and then became an Aranker, only multiplied by a numerous scale of ten to a hundredfold in strength. They were here for a single purpose. The destroy. Now this is interesting. Jin looked over to his superior, watching as he looked up to the sky, or what would have been the sky, if it wasn't for Yamamoto's prison he was holding them in. The turncoat wondered how Aizen could sense anything beyond this prison when he could not, but apparently he could because there he was with that common small smile on his face. You know what's happening out there I take it? Jin asked with that same serpentine smile. Indeed, something very unexpected has happened, Aizen replied as he looked over in his first lieutenant's direction. Yes, something very unexpected indeed. Will it be a problem? Tosin asked. It will be, Aizen replied, smile reforming into a frown, which was rare for him. Anything which could make Sasuke's and show even the slightest signs of doubt was a worthy opponent indeed. We will have a tougher fight of it than I thought. The rulers of the Hollow have returned. The Nine Lords? Tosin asked with a skeptical frown. Indeed, so it wasn't an old children's tale after all, Jin muttered before looking up at the jagged edges of flame and smiling. This could be fun. It is a setback, Tosin corrected, looking right at Ichimaru. It is a small setback, and it may work to our favor, the renegade captain replied. There are only three of them here, others may be coming, but they might even out the balance. He watched as the three of them settled into their thrones, both unnerved, intrigued and horrified by what he saw. Jinrikzai Shijikuni Yamamoto was not a man who was easily startled, but this was such a time. It took him a while to realize who these three were, but once he recognized their faces, he saw the horrors they could unleash upon the battlefield, with a very real dread. He recognized all three of them. Ijido, the second lord, the azure cat, the lady of the bloody claws. Rashi, the fourth lord, the killer baboon, master of lava and flame. Naruto, the ninth lord, the firstborn, the emperor of the foxes. As terrifying as it was in seeing any of the mythical nine lords in the flesh seeing him was by far the worst of all. He still remembered that battle, fought three thousand years ago, which destroyed so much in the time span of three days. How one of those nine tails could turn a forest into a wasteland with a single stroke if angered, and he was angry that day, furious that day. He had cared not for what he would destroy, because everything had been taken from him. His brothers and sisters, his chosen warriors and his mate, yes, that day he would have destroyed Waco Mundo if he could have. It was not wise to face this man's wrath. But a lot has happened since then, and he was not the man he remembered himself as. He was far stronger now than he was then. So Yamamoto remained where he was and waited, waited for the released masters of Holodom to make the first move, and then find a way to counter them. The first eight, while all powerful in their own right were not the main threat. He was. The Ninth Lord was always and always will be the main threat. The Ninth Lord's eyes leveled upon him and flashed an angry crimson. Yamamoto simply returned his glare for what seemed an eternity before he relented. He still remembered, of course he remembered. But he had no regrets, the woman was a hollow, and all hollows were the same menace. That's what he told himself, so he could sleep better at night. I love you. He closed his eyes, forcing that sweet voice to the farthest corners of his mind and slamming it into a box, never to hear her ever again. He had used her to weaken them, nothing more. He knew she was the youngest and the easiest deceived. He felt nothing for her, nothing. The look of betrayal in her eyes as he turned against her. How when she saw his intent, how the life which was once in those grey orbs suddenly went blank. Her voice still hounded him, even to this day, with tears rolling down her cheeks and pain in her eyes. Why? 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 He shut his eyes tightly. She was a hollow. What did she know of love? I have a bone to pick with you. He looked up to lock eyes with him, most powerful of the nine lords, and by far the most protective. When he heard what he had done to her he had given him that crisscrossing scar on his forehead. When he heard of what his three seniors had done to the second he killed them without mercy. When he heard of the Soul King's ambition he fought him for three days and nights without rest or reprieve. But I'll wait, he added as he leaned back into his chair. If she isn't here to avenge herself then I'll have to do it for her. It was then that the gargantuan opened and a single figure stepped out. She was petite yet tall, with brown skin the color of chocolate, which contrasted with light green hair and orange eyes, the color of vibrant amber. She wore a sleeveless white shirt which cut off at the midriff, and a pair of short pants which cut off at the knees, knee-high white jackboots. She took a deep breath, grinned and stepped forward, snapping the fingers of her left hand to call upon her own high-backed, white marble throne beside the second lord which she immediately sat upon. Didn't miss the party did I? She asked with a wide childish smile. On the contrary, the ninth replied to the seventh. You're right on time. I was just telling Yujito and Rashi to take their pick of who they want to fight, eldest first. That's not fair, she replied with a pout. That's only because you're the youngest here. 
Naruto countered with a teasing smile. Don't worry. You'll get your opponent. Before she could reply the other female, Yujito, leaned forward, smiled and pointed to the female Espada and Toshiro. I want those too. Suit yourself, Naruto shrugged before turning to Rashi. And you? Hmm, the fourth lord frowned before setting his gaze upon the Espada in the visage of an old man and Captain Sui FNG. I want those too. Naruto grinned widely before turning to the seventh lord, you see, you still get the strongest ones. Good, she replied as she looked over at the long-haired Espada, as well as Captain Shunsui Kamraku and Jikshur Muki take. I look forward to it. The ninth lord's eyes fell upon Yamamoto then, and bored into him. Let's see how long they last. The second, fourth and seventh lords all piped up in agreement before standing up, their thrones disintegrating behind them, and took off towards their chosen battle zones, all the while the ninth lord kept eye contact with Yamamoto, unmoving and intent. The intent behind the gaze was crystal clear. Who is the best? He had complete confidence in his brethren. Did Yamamoto say the same? The end. So how was this part, I hope you like it. And if you like it share this part with your friends and like the video too. And don't forget to subscribe our channel for daily awesome fanfiction. Okay it's time for me to go. Bye bye.